you will join me in your Bibles, Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, we'll be looking at verses 18 through 29. Now, as we've been working through Jesus' letters to the churches in the book of Revelation during our Lord's Supper services, we've seen commendations. We've seen rebukes, we've seen promises of tender care and mercy, and we have seen warnings of judgment. Today, in Jesus' letter to the church at Thyatira, we see a commendation, a rebuke, a promise of judgment, and a promise of mercy. So we get uh, most of what we've seen in the other letters all in one. We see the exposing of a false teacher within the church. And a promise of judgment upon all those who would follow after that false teacher. And it's a sober warning. It's a sober word for us. Now one of the greatest things about the Bible for us is that we know the full story. So we don't have to bite our fingernails over what is going to happen in the end. What's going, uh, what's going to become of all of this. But that doesn't eliminate the reality that there is a lot of sadness and tragedy in the middle of the story. There's a lot of unfaithfulness. And we're living like the church in Thyatira in the middle of the story. This has a lot of application for us. So let's read carefully and see what Jesus has to say to this church in Revelation 2, beginning in verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your later works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality, and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, And I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, this letter begins with words that are repeated from chapter 1. Remember, as John was describing his revelation back in chapter 1 and verse 12, he writes, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with the long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. And so then here in verse 18, we see the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. And so we understand that the one being referred to in chapter 1 is Jesus, the Son of God. And this is Jesus. It's wonderful. It's Jesus saying, I am the Lord of the church. This is my church. These are my people for whom my blood was shed. 
And the imagery here is drawn primarily from Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 10. And most scholars agree that the point here is that Christ is a kingly, priestly figure based on those texts in Daniel and the description of the clothing that we see here in Revelation. Now part of the priestly role for Christ is to tend to the lampstands or the churches. The Old Testament priests would trim the lamps, they would remove the wick of the old oil, they would refill the lamps with fresh oil, and then they would relight the lamps as they had gone out. So likewise, Christ as priest tends to the churches, the lampstands, commending them, correcting them, exhorting them, warning them in order to secure the church's fitness for service as light bearers in a dark world. And it's really a beautiful image. And we see Christ playing out this role in each of these letters through the book of Revelation. So we see Christ's sovereign oversight over the churches. And he shows us that he is consistently present with his faithful churches. Never leaving the church to herself. But the language also shows us that that Jesus as a latter a latter-day divine judge. And since he's always with his church, he knows what the church is doing. He always knows her spiritual condition, which will result in either blessing or judgment. He sees everything. He sees every hidden motive. He even sees those things which we try to hide from ourselves. He is morally pure. And so his feet are like burnished bronze, which means he will become the basis for his demand that all who walk with him must reflect something of the purity that he possesses in the midst of an evil world. And so altogether, we have the King of heaven, Jesus Christ, the bridegroom and the judge of the bride walking in her midst, directing her on her path, and remaining faithful to her, calling her to moral purity, commending her in the way of righteousness, blessing her in the midst of trials and suffering, and making her uh, more fit to bear the light of the gospel. It's a beautiful picture of who Christ is for his church. And so along those lines, the first thing we see is a commendation in verse 19. He shows us that Jesus loves a faithful, persevering church. Verse 19, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. Doesn't this sound a bit like 1 Corinthians 13? Faith, hope, and love. Look at this church. Their works are marked by love and faith and service and patient endurance. And not only that, it's not this sort of weak peripheral or surface thing, it's the real deal. It's really happening in this church, real service. And on top of that, they're sticking to it. They're persevering through it. Now, no doubt, they likely had a very keen sense that God is moving um, in their midst. They're doing more now than they used to do before, so it is this persevering type of Christianity. Now, many of us in our Christian lives have probably experienced something of a leveling out. Many years ago, uh, more now than I wish it had been, but I used to run a lot of marathons and do triathlons. And one of the things that I was always very aware of is at the beginning of a race, you're filled with adrenaline and you pumped up and you're ready to go and you're just there waiting to get after it and as soon as the gun goes off it's easy to get wrapped up in all of the commotion of it and you don't hold back you just go for it as hard as you can but after you've run a few races you realize to start off you need to hold back it's long a marathon 26.2 miles of running so while Someone might have really pressed on the gas at the starting line. You'll see them at mile five or mile 10, and soon they're behind you because they didn't keep the right pace. And when we become Christians, at first, our our tendency is to sprint hard and fast. But what we do sometimes is we sort of push aside all the rest of our lives, and at some point, we have to realize, look, this is not a sprint. 
I have, I'm in this for the long haul, so I, I, can, I can't learn it all and I can't take it all in overnight. I'm, I'm not going to. It's not going to happen. I need to realize this is going to take my entire life. And that's not to say that we, uh, we, we should become or that we do become less committed or less faithful or that we back off from studying and learning, but it is to say that the Christian life is a life of perseverance, steady perseverance. Jesus loves a church of people that realize that our works, our love, our faith, and our service is not something we do today and it's gone tomorrow because we petered out soon after the gun went off. It's realizing that the Christian life is one of patient endurance. We set the pace and we go for the marathon until we hit the finish line. Now this is why, for example, one of the qualifications for an elder is that he's not a novice. He's not a new convert because what happens? A lot of us have been there, right? We get a little bit of knowledge and that's a dangerous thing because we know just a little bit more than someone else. And so then all of the sudden we fancy ourselves experts and we're going to go out and correct everyone's bad theology. We're going to go out and fix all the bad churches and we're going to make sure that people who have been Christians for 30 or 40 years know that the prelapsarian covenant of redemption is an essential framework within which to view the eschatological unfolding of the plenary inspired word of God as a meta-narrative beginning at the inauguration of the kingdom and concluding with the full consummation of the eschaton. And if you don't get that, (laughs) you need to check yourself. I mean, I know it's true because I read it in an article on the internet. But that's where we often are, right? We're new believers. We want to learn and grow as much and as fast as we can. But if we're not accountable to others and we're not willing to listen to their wisdom and guidance, we're going to become very proud very quickly. And sooner than later, we will fizzle out and we will fall out. The Christian life is one of slow, steady growth. It's one of setting our compass on eternity and making slow, faithful progress in the same direction day after day. And Jesus loves that. He commends that. I might not look a whole lot different tomorrow than I do today, but in five years, you can see progress. In 20 years, you can see a lot of progress. And that's the kind of church that Jesus loves. The strongest, sturdiest trees aren't the ones that shoot up in a few months. They're the ones that are growing for years and years, bit by bit, little at a time. We want to be spiritual oak trees, not some flimsy piece of balsa wood in the wind. And so Jesus commends the church as a whole for their faithful perseverance. But he has a rebuke as well because Jesus is a master physician. If your entire body is in great shape, but your heart is about to stop beating, The doctor doesn't say, well, the rest of you is great, so we're not going to worry about the heart. We'll ignore that bit and get on with life. Right? That's negligent. That's that's male practice. And so Jesus wants to diagnose the problem. He wants to deal with the entire body, not just commend what's working. He has four verses to deal with what's wrong. And part of this rebuke is in verses 20 and 21, where we see that Jesus hates spiritual adultery. The thing that Jesus has against this congregation is their tolerance. Isn't that interesting? They tolerate too much. It's quite different, as we even just thought about during this morning's sermon. It sounds quite different from the world around us, doesn't it? Where do, we, where do we see this? Well, first, who is this Jezebel that is being tolerated? Most people are familiar with Jezebel's name. We have some idea of what she did. Jezebel shows up in the Old Testament. She was Ahab's wife. But the problem was that she was a pagan woman marrying the king of Israel. Now, in many ways, she was the power behind the throne. And she's a perfect example of a wicked woman. Jezebel hated the prophet Elijah. She tried to have him killed on more than one occasion. And her great desire was to bring pagan worship into the covenant community of Israel. 
Now, since her husband Ahab was a spineless, girly man, she basically ruled the roost, and he did whatever she wanted him to do so that she could get what she wanted. So what does that have to do with this letter? Well, in this congregation was apparently a Jezebel. Not someone named Jezebel, but someone by comparison. Jesus is rebuking a person in the church who is like Jezebel. Notice here, Jesus says that she is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. So there's an issue here of what she is teaching, and she's very charismatic, she's very persuasive, and what she's saying is false. She calls herself, we see in verse 20, a prophetess. In other words, she's claiming that she is the voice of God. She's speaking for God. So she wasn't only teaching, but she's claiming to be God's mouthpiece. She would be downplaying the regular life and ministry of the local church as superficial, quite opposed to what Jesus commended, the steady state of the Christian life, moving forward, patiently enduring. Instead, she's saying, if you want to go deeper, you need to read my books and come to my seminars and watch my television show and use my study guide. And if you do that, you'll get really deep. Now, Jezebel in the Old Testament was so influential that she seemingly had this army of followers that worshipped Baal with her. And, and she, they all did things of the most debased, immoral nature imaginable. It was quite often of a sexual na- nature. But in this text, Jesus isn't saying that the church is being sexually immoral. That isn't about the physical act of sexual immorality. It's an illusion here that's pointing to spiritual adultery. Just as the relationship in the old covenant between God and his covenant people is to run parallel to a husband and wife relationship, in the new covenant we also see the relationship between a husband and wife to run parallel to the relationship between Christ and the church. That is, Paul tells us in Ephesians 5, the fundamental basis of a marriage relationship. But in this instance, The church has bitten off some kind of false teaching, and in doing so, they are committing spiritual adultery. They are descending into the immoral pit of this Jezebel-led idolatry. In other words, to be blunt, they are whoring themselves out to other gods. That's what Jesus is getting at, and he hates it. He hates spiritual adultery. I want to help us see this teaching here. In verse 24, He commends those who are not falling into this. But notice what he says there. He says, But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. So Jesus doesn't say here this sexual immorality and physical adultery. He says this teaching. And so you've got this prophetess giving supposed deeper teachings. She's telling them she has some really deep stuff for them. But, when, uh, but what she's saying is really from Satan. So Jesus calls it Satan's deep teachings. It's false teaching. It's leading people to destruction. And the church has been allowing it to happen. The church is allowing her to come in and destroy sound doctrine. And listen, there are some people who are always trying to give you some special inside track on how to be spiritual. And they can lead you astray very easily. And if a church is just so open and so tolerant that they sort of let every kind of poison in, and they call it faithfulness and love for Jesus and spirituality because somebody calls it Christian, some young zealous Christian or some poorly taught older Christians can be so empty-headed that it will do tremendous damage. But thousands and likely millions of people in the world today will have someone tell them, do these things and you will have all that you want. And no doubt the man or woman telling them this is saying, I'm a prophet. I'm a prophetess. God has told me this. God is revealing this to me. These are the deeper things of God for those who have enough faith to believe God for what you're asking. Now look, the point for us 
Again, we need balance here. The point for us is not to become heresy hounds, looking for every way a person is wrong so that we can blast them and put them on notice that we've got our eye on them. The point is that we need to be certain that our focus is on Christ, that our focus is on the God of the Bible and not a worldly, selfish, flesh-driven ambition for which we simply try to use God for our own ends. Even very well-meaning people can have a methodology or a way of thinking to where they end up depending on themselves and their thinking instead of God himself. What may seem like deep teaching, what gets presented as deep teaching, Jesus tells us is actually the deep things of Satan. When the devil comes along, he's not going to come along and say, hey, look, here's a great big packet of lies. Go ahead and believe it. No, he's going to come with a Jezebel, someone who's extremely dangerous, who claims she's a prophetess. She's probably good looking, a smooth talker, and she's going to promise something deeper. She's going to dress it up uh, in a fancy cover or in a flashy conference or in a glass pulpit and make it look like it's slick and worthy of your time and your effort and your ear and your heart. So brothers and sisters, we have to be very careful that we are discerning. I love what I read by D.A. Carson. He wrote this. He said, methodologically, the only way you ever begin to get it right is to read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible, and read the Bible. We're a generation that is not a great generation of Bible readers. We proof text the Bible now and then, but we haven't steeped our minds in scripture so that we've learned to think God's thoughts after him. That's what we need. And if we don't have that, the warning here is that we will be whores to another God and we will commit spiritual adultery. Jesus hates it. And we see the results of that in verses 22 and 23, that Jesus will judge unfaithfulness. Now, as we've seen already, the Lord is not just a judge of all creation in general, but very specifically, he's also the judge of the church. We're not going to camp out here because we've dealt with this in one of the previous letters. But here we see it again. In some way, Christ has warned this group of false teachers to repent, whoever they are, the Jezebel in the church. He's given them time to repent. They have not repented. And so Christ announces that he will punish this false teacher and also all those who are following after her. And yet, we still see the mercy of God, don't we? What does he say here? He says, unless they repent of her works. There's still time. He gives them time. Jezebel's punishment is to be cast onto a sickbed. It's an allusion to suffering. While the followers will face, he says, great tribulation. In other words, they will face significant punishment. Now, consequently, it's the same language that's used for those who have rejected Christ altogether, proving to us exactly what's going on here. While they're in the church, they're claiming to be Christians, they're proving otherwise. They will all suffer punishment if they do not repent of false teaching and belief. And this judgment of tribulation will become so well known that it will be evident to all the churches that Christ is the judge who he claims to be, since he is able both to know who is guilty and righteous and to respond to every individual accordingly. The false teachers of Thyatira may promote involvement in idolatry and be able to hide their evil motives from the eyes of others, but God sees all, and all will be made known. Now, it seems harsh, maybe. Maybe you read this and think, he's being harsh. She's a false teacher. Just leave her alone. People will figure it out. Don't worry about it. But think about it. This is Jesus' bride. These are Jesus' people. These are God's children. If you're a mother or if you're a father and if someone is seeking to do harm to your child, won't you do everything possible in order to guard your little ones? 
If someone you love is in the middle of a train track and the train is coming, won't you do everything in your power to get them off that track? Won't you even risk your own life to make that happen? But you see, these things are just for a time. Jesus' concern is eternity. Jesus is the father of his spiritual children. He's the husband of his spiritual bride. He understands the false teaching and and ungodly influence is far more dangerous to a local church than even persecution and martyrdom. That will never destroy the church of Jesus Christ, but false teaching and ungodly influences most certainly will. But thanks be to God for what he shows us finally in verses 24 through 29 that Jesus is always faithful to his bride. At the beginning of the letter, Jesus commended the church for persevering. And here again, we have a word on perseverance. He says, hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end To him I will give authority over the nations. He's telling them, if you are faithful and you are true to my word, stay faithful and stay true to my word. Delight in it. Hold on to what you have. Be faithful because I am holding on to you. He's commending all who will press on without being seduced into false teaching by someone else and he's promising them that their inheritance will be the nations. Now, brothers and sisters, there's no way to emphasize enough how important it is that all of us know the Bible really well, that all of us know what it says, not just individual texts, but the entire story. And within that story, all the parts that make up the whole. We need to know what and how the Bible argues for what it argues. We need to always make sure that we keep up the guardrails of sound teaching in our own lives because it's incredibly easy sometimes to want the text to say something different than what it actually does. And oh, how I pray that this, uh, this, this isn't just a few individuals, but the entire church, this entire church, you and I, we want to be commended by Christ encouraged to persevere in the truth, knowing and holding to the truth of his word, not wavering from it, persevering in it, and not letting go. That's what we want. And in our day, there are many opportunities to waver from the truth, and it would be easy to do. There are professing believers, many pastors, entire churches, now entire denominations that are making all kinds of public statements about how they've changed their views on certain things to conform to the changing times of our day to be more tolerant. But Jesus rebukes the church that is too tolerant and his promise is swift judgment. So for the church to change directions wherever the wind blows is not faithfulness, It's cowardice because of a desire to not ever have to say hard things because they know to say those hard things from time to time means people will run up against it. And yes, it will be painful. It can be costly if you have to stand against something that will no no doubt earn you the label of intolerant or bigoted or hateful or unloving. But our concerns, brethren, are not set here on the earth. Our eyes are on eternity. And eventually we will see that the pain and the suffering and the trial is worth the finishing result. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. As when earthen pots are broken to pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my father, and I will give him the morning star. Brothers and sisters, we have the great and distinct privilege that one day we will rule with Christ in the new heavens and the new earth forever and ever. And so do you know Christ? Do you have faith in Christ? Do you want an eternity with Christ? And so the call from the Lord Jesus is to turn to him, the one who loves and provides and keeps his bride as a faithful bridegroom, never wavering from her, always steadfastly caring for his church. Do not turn from him, run to him. And the reality is that so often, 
talk to those who are not in Christ and perhaps they have a general sense of their need, their spiritual need for Christ. And yet they will say, I've done too much or I just want to straighten some things out in my life before I come to him. But here's the reality, friend. You will never clean yourself up. You will never get to a place where you think yourself worthy to come to Christ because you're not worthy to come to Christ. The only reason you'd ever be called worthy is because you are in Christ. Because Christ himself is the one who makes us worthy before the Father. Because it's Christ's righteousness upon which we stand and not our own. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is calling you to faithfulness to his word. And part of being faithful to his word is that initial call that he gives. Come to me. Put your trust in me. Have faith in me. Turn from this world, turn from your sin, and walk to me. Patiently, perseveringly, to the end. He will never cast you out. He will never turn you away when you come to him by faith and trust in the one who is the great bridegroom of the church. And you will have the everlasting privilege of getting to know more and more of him day by day as you grow in the truth. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us, church, be faithful to him all the days of our lives. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to Emmanuel Baptist Church. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. And we pray now asking, O God, that you would help us to persevere in faith that you would help us to to continue to steadfastly walk in the truth of your word. Help us, O God, to love and cherish your word. Help us to store your word up in our hearts that we might not depart from it. Help us, O God, to never cast a look outside, but that we would constantly keep our eyes upon our bridegroom, that we would be faithful to the end, that as Jezebels may come and go with their false teaching and their promises for a deeper spirituality, may we always remember that these are only the deeper things of Satan. Help us to reject the evil one in all of his lies, that we may continually embrace and walk in the truth of what you have delivered to us in your word. And so we ask all of these things with thankful hearts for all that you are for us, in the Lord Jesus Christ, our only Savior and Lord. And we pray this all in his name. Amen.